Hello everyone. Welcome back to Analog Snippets. We all know that if two inductors are in parallel, the equivalent inductor value is given by this equation. In the case when these two inductor values are equal, this equation gives equivalent value of half the original inductance. But this equation is only true for magnetically isolated inductors. Magnetically isolated inductors are inductors living in two different worlds. In the same world, inductors have so-called mutual inductance between them. And in presence of mutual inductance, this equation becomes more complicated. We all know that inductors have something to do with magnetic fields. And magnetic fields are generated by currents. The values L1 and L2, which is also called self-inductance, self as opposed to mutual, they are generated by their own currents. Now, magnetic fields are spread out in space as opposed to current which is contained in the physical wire. So, it's quite possible to be affected by magnetic fields which are generated by current flowing in some other places. And mutual inductance account for effects due to those magnetic fields. So, current flowing in L1 affects L2 and current flowing in L2 affects L1. And that is why it is called mutual inductance. To complicate the matter further, magnetic field is a vector quantity. So magnetic fields can either add or subtract. As a result, we can either have a positive mutual inductance when inductors are aligned or we can have negative mutual inductance in case inductors are anti-aligned. As a result, the equivalent inductance of two equal and parallel inductors of value L can range anywhere between 0 to L depending on the value of mutual inductance. Obviously, when we account for the M, this equation is modified. In fact, they actually have two equations here because of this minus plus sign in the denominator. Minus sign is for aligned inductors and plus sign is for anti-aligned inductors. So what I'm going to do in this video is to explore this equation further. And towards the end of the video, I'm going to give a derivation of this equation just in case you are interested. So let's get going. Let's first take the case of aligned inductors. First thing to note is that when m is 0, this equation reduces to the familiar equation L1 L2 over L1 plus L2. Now, we are subtracting m in some form in both numerator and denominator. So, in the first look, it may not be clear if the overall value is increasing or decreasing. So, let's make some simplification. Let's assume L1 and L2 are equal. In that case, M will always be between 0 and L. That is, M can never exceed L. That is because the least one inductor can couple to the other inductor is no magnetic field, in which case M is 0, or its own entire magnetic field in which case M is L. In order for M to be more than L, you need to couple more magnetic field than you can generate to the other inductor, which is, well, not realistic. So let's see what happens to this equation when both inductors are equal. So this is the first step and we can further simplify this equation. In this step, I have used the identity A square minus B square equal to A plus B and A minus B. So we see that L minus M cancels out in numerator and denominator. And finally, we get a very simple equation, which is L plus M over 2. Now, if M is 0, this reduces to just L over 2. And that is what we would expect if we didn't know about mutual inductance. Two equal inductances in parallel? No problems. Value gets half. But in presence of mutual inductance, we get more than half. And in the other direction, n can be as large as L. And in that case, equivalent inductance is just L. Think about it for a moment. You have two inductors in parallel and it doesn't make any difference. I mean, how does it even make sense? So let's take a physical example and try to make sense of it. Let's assume we have two parallel bond wires. Now the partial self-inductance of a wire is given by this equation. Now, don't worry about the word partial at the moment. It is just a technically correct term. Self-inductances are always either partial or loop. Partial only indicates that I am considering part of a loop. Okay, back to the equation. 
In this equation, small l is the length of the wire and r is the radius of the wire. Length is in millimeters and inductance is in nanohenries. Now in video 39, I gave the equations of resistance and capacitance, but I did not offer any equation for the inductance. So here is the equation. If you have to memorize one inductance equation, this is the one I would recommend. Now this equation is not exact. It is only true when L is much greater than R, 10 times greater or more. But that is usually the case. So this is a pretty good approximation. Let's try to unpack this equation. First thing to notice is that the inductance value increases with increasing L. And this is what we would expect because longer the wire, higher the inductance. But then there is a second term which also contains L. Here ln represents natural logarithm. Now the second term also increases with increasing L. Although much more weakly because it is a logarithmic increase. And so if you double your wire length, your inductance more than doubles. And this is something which doesn't happen with resistance and capacitance. The reason it happens with inductance is well mutual inductance. Suppose you double the length of the wire. That additional wire length not only has self-inductance, it also has mutual inductance. So part of wire affect each other. Now we have this radius term as well in the denominator. And that means inductance value reduces with wire radius. And that is something that we expect. A thicker wire has lower inductance. But this dependence is pretty weak because this R term is inside the logarithmic term. Okay, so that was it about the equations. Now let's plug in some values. Let's assume bond wire length to be 1 mm and thickness to be 1 mil. 1 mil is approximately 25 micrometer. So in this case, the assumption that L is much larger than R is correct. So now let's calculate the value of individual bond wire inductance and we get 0.815 nanohenry. Notice that this value is pretty close to the rule of thumb value I gave in video 39, which was one nanohenry per millimeter of wire length. Okay, so we started with one bond wire, but we wanted to reduce the effective inductance. So we brought in another bond wire and put it in parallel to the first one. But since these two bond wires are placed pretty close to each other, there will be significant mutual inductance between them. We will calculate mutual inductance in a minute, but before that, let's assume what happens for the worst case for the mutual inductance. Worst case, which is largest mutual inductance will happen when these two bond wires are literally touching each other. In that case, we will effectively have a single bond wire. Only the cross section area will be doubled. And if we double the wire cross section area, that means radius is increased by root two times. So let's see what happens if we put the new value of radius in this equation. And we find that value has reduced for sure, but reduction is much smaller. In fact, we have less than 9% reduction in the value. And here you have the physical intuition of why inductances do not reduce that much when connected in parallel. Now, notice that this is not the case with resistances and capacitances. Resistance will still get half if two wires are touching each other. And same with capacitance, it will get doubled even if two capacitors are literally touching each other. Okay, so now the question is how far we need to keep these bond wires for mutual inductance effect to be negligible. The rule of thumb here is you can ignore the mutual inductance if they are as apart as their length. So let's explore this further. Mutual inductance between two aligned wires is given by this equation. And this is with the assumption that wire distance is much greater than individual wire radius, which is a fair assumption. Don't worry, I don't expect you to remember this equation. It is just to prove our rule of thumb. Here D is the distance between the wire. So let's put L equal D and see what happens. So after plugging the values, we get the mutual inductance value of 0.093 nanohenries which is little over 11% of self-inductance value. So yes, this rule of thumb works. If you manage to keep these two bond wires apart by more than their length, then you can ignore the mutual inductance. For anything below that, well, consider the mutual inductance value. By the way, if wires are closely placed, that is if L is much greater than D, then this equation reduces to a much simplified form.
In that case, basically you can ignore one from this term and D over L from these two terms. And you get an equation which is very similar to the partial self-inductance of a wire. Again, ignore the term partial. I'm just being technically correct. In fact, this equation is exactly same as the previous equation if you replace R by D. Okay, let's now move to anti-aligned inductors. But before we do that, a note about dot convention. The question is, how do you know if this M is for aligned inductors or anti-aligned inductors? And yes, you guessed it right. The answer is dot convention. We put a little dot at one end of the inductor. And if dots are placed at the same side, it is aligned inductors. In that case, the mutual inductance increases the net inductance. In case of anti-aligned inductors, we place dot at the opposite corners of the inductors. And as we will see, in this case, the net inductance reduces. So basically, if current direction is the same in the dot of both inductor, it is the case of aligned inductors. But as the case of this diagram, if current is entering in the dot of one inductor but leaving at the dot of other inductor, it is a case of anti-aligned inductors. We can start with the equation of the aligned inductor and replace m by minus m and we get the equation for anti-aligned inductors. Since numerator contains a square term, it basically doesn't change. So change is only in the denominator. And since we have already substituted the minus term in the equation, we can simply use the absolute value of m. This equation makes a clear prediction of the change direction of the equivalent value of inductance as m increases. With 0m, we have familiar uncoupled parallel inductance equation. And with increasing m, the numerator decreases and denominator increases. And that means that the overall value reduces. In the special case when L1 and L2 are equal and M is also equal to that value, this whole thing reduces to just zero. And that is surprising, isn't it? Because we started with two inductors and we ended up with none. So let's try to make a physical intuition about it. Let's consider a circular loop of wire with inductance L and current I. If we place another similar loop in its vicinity, they will form an aligned inductor pair. But now if we change the current direction in one loop, they become anti-aligned pair. Now consider what happens if we put these two loops literally on the top of each other. Since the current directions are opposite, they will cancel each other and there will be zero current in the combined loop. And zero current means no magnetic field and that means no inductance. So that is the intuition behind how anti-aligned inductors reduce the mutual inductance. Their magnetic field tends to cancel each other. This magnetic cancellation behavior has many practical applications. If you have a current loop with high inductance, split it into two and place them side by side in anti-aligned fashion so that their magnetic fields cancel. Now let's quickly consider inductors in series. Two uncoupled inductors in series simply add. And if there is a mutual inductance between them, we simply modify the values of individual L by adding M to it. In this case, current direction is same at the dot, so this is the case of aligned inductors. And we can further simplify this equation by adding these two m's together. And this equation explains why if we start with a wire and double its length, its inductance value more than doubles. That is because these wire lengths have mutual inductance between each other. For the case of anti-aligned inductors, we simply replace m by minus m. And that means the effective inductance value will be less than the simple sum of the two values. Now, it may be difficult to imagine the anti-aligned series inductors. But there is a simple practical example. Power and ground rails. Let's assume we are delivering power to a load RL. The power and ground rails individually have some partial inductance. And this whole thing is in series. Now, in an isolated world where there is no mutual inductance, you will simply add the power and ground inductance values. But in real world, there will be some mutual inductance. And since current direction is opposite at the dot end, they form anti-aligned inductor pair. And the net result is that the total effective inductance will be smaller than the individual wire inductance suggests. And that is the reason that it is recommended that you place the power and ground rail as close as possible. Now, 
It doesn't seem fair that we have a simple equation for the series inductors but a rather unintuitive and complicated form for the parallel inductors. So as promised earlier, now I will derive the parallel inductance equation with mutual inductance and there hopefully we will understand why there is this apparent asymmetry between parallel and series inductance equations. So let's get done with it. Okay, so what is the most intuitive way to go about it? We can imagine that the presence of mutual inductance changes the effective inductance of the individual inductors. And then we plug these new values into the standard parallel inductance formula. So let's start with the most obvious value as our first guess. After all, we know that it is true for the series case. But little thought will show that this would not be right. Let's consider what would be the inductor voltage equation with this effective value. Following this step, we get this equation. Can you spot the obvious problem? This is supposed to be a mutual inductance, but there is nothing mutual about it. There is no I2 term in this equation. But if we replace the di1 here with di2, we'll get the correct equation. And we can write this equation into more intuitively obvious form. I have taken di1 over dt out from these two terms. And this term inside the square bracket, that is our effective inductance. And from this equation, you can appreciate why series case is reduced to a simpler form. That is because in series case, by definition, the current flowing in both inductors are same. So this ratio over here is just one. Okay, how to find this ratio? That would be simple. We know that the voltage across these two inductors is equal. And voltage is given by equation L di by dt. And we can use the second equality to find our desired ratio. In this step, I have expanded the equation. And now I'll collect the similar terms together. I think you can work out the algebra here. And from this last equation, we can find our desired ratio. Now that we have our desired ratio, let's put it back into our effective inductance equation. And we can further simplify it. And finally, here is our effective inductance. We can similarly find out the other effective inductance. The numerator of the both equation is same and they only differ in the denominator. Now either we can put these values directly into this equation or we can have a more simplified form. I'm going to use this simplified form. And now if we invert it, we'll get our final answer. So here we are. I hope this intuitive derivation makes more sense to you. Now I'll spend some time in unpacking this effective inductance equations. Let's assume we start with unequal inductance value. Say L1 is 10 nano and L2 is 5 nano. Now let's assume that mutual inductance value starts from 0 and approaches the value of L2. As this happens, the effective value of L1 increases sharply. In fact, when M becomes equal to L2, the value of L1 dash becomes infinity. But value of L2 dash simply becomes L2. But what does it mean? An infinite inductance means there will be no current into it. And the whole current flows into L2. Now consider this equation again. A smaller L value will have higher di by dt across it. And that means smaller inductance will have more effect on the larger inductance than the other way around. And in the case when there is zero current into L1, well because it has become infinity, L2 will have no effect from I1. So its value remains unchanged. So there are some surprising observations. And I will urge you to ponder more on that. This has been a long video, probably the longest that I have ever made. And I hope it was worth it. So please write your comments below and thanks for watching.